This is meant to be a introduction to PA, performance analytics. I want to get you all going in PA if you haven't used it before. So off we go. Uh, of course, we have our safe harbor notice. So I'm sure you've all seen this uh, at some of the other knowledge events. I'm not going to read it word for word, but just know that it exists. So here's our agenda for today. So we're going to talk about data collectors, indicator sources, and breakdown sources. How do they get populated? How do we use them? Of course, indicators and our breakdowns. And then what do we do with this data? So dashboards and widgets. So continue on. Uh, so a little bit about me. Uh, so I'm a cloud uh, tech architect, delivery manager for Accenture. Um, I have spent uh, the last nine years working on ServiceNow. I actually started working on ServiceNow before they use city names. So pre-Aspen, they actually use seasons and years. So spring 2011 is where I started. Uh, I spent my first six years doing domain separation. Uh, and if any of you are working on do domain separation, uh, good luck. I mean, it's always 10 times harder compared to like a single tenant but it's very challenging and fun. I'm a five-year uh, community MVP. I've got uh, ITSM certs and you know several micro certs. Uh, right now, I'm part of a large uh, team working on a global instance, uh, ITSM, HR, integrations, uh, PA. So I'm supposed to be on this account for six months. Uh, we'll see. Um, I've been focused on change management. We didn't have anybody who could take over change management. So I took over change management. I'm helping out the integrations team and I'm doing service catalog work. Um, we actually committed to doing 150 service catalogs. So I decided to help out that team as well. Accenture, if you don't know Accenture, so we're a ServiceNow partner, one of the largest partners. Um, we help out a lot of companies, uh, 95 in the Fortune 500 and three quarter in the Fortune 100, three quarters of them are in 500. We have over five, 500,000 employees. I always refer to it as a small planet. So, uh, but it's great. The company's been great. I've spent most of my time internal IT, except for last October, I switched to Accenture and everything's been great. So enough about me. So PA, What's the difference between PA and like standard reporting? So reporting, as most of you have already used, always gives you a snapshot of the current status. So if I run a report on say uh, open incidents, that's all I see is the number of open incidents. I can't compare that to yesterday. I can't compare that to last month. Um, so it always gives you a current snapshot. A lot of companies build multiple reports where they um, show me all the reports for company A and then all the reports for all the incidents for company B um, or by group, by priority. So you end up with all of these extra reports that sometimes you just don't need compared to PA. PA is about enabling businesses to track their progress, right? Against goals. So let's identify issues in the company. Let's identify bottlenecks. Do we have enough resources? Do we have too many resources? Things like that. PA, I say, requires a little extra planning, um, but the overall goal will be to give you this beautiful dashboard that drives your business. At a quick glance, you can look at it and go, oh yeah, we need to fix this problem. So, where do we get started? I put this slide in here because unlike our normal development cycle where we build in dev and maybe push to test or staging and then production, all of our reporting data exists in production. Just like a normal report, we need to build our PA reports in production. So we do not build them in dev and migrate them, always build in production. If you have a brand new instance, it came with the free version. I put that in quotes because it seems to change all the time, but it's the free version of PAs loaded. So you're welcome to utilize that out of the box. Um, 
And then you need to get with your stakeholders, determine what needs to be measured. What are we going to measure against, right? Push back when they say everything, because that's always a bad idea, right? Um, so you need to set specific goals on what you're going to measure. So I put a couple of examples, like how long does it take to close an incident? How long did it take to close an incident this month compared to last month? Um, we added more people, so it should be faster. Is it faster? Is it slower? Things like that. What percentage of incidents are resolved within my SLA commitments? So here's what we're going to talk about. This is uh, the architecture. So we're going to talk about the data collectors. We're going to talk about the source tables, indicator source, breakdown sources, how they get populated from the data collectors. We'll talk about an indicator and then the breakdowns that you can apply to these indicators. And then after you have them built, well, what do you do with them? So you create a widget and put them on a dashboard. So this is the journey that we're going to take today. So data collectors. So data collectors are the engines that run out and collect the data. They are responsible for populating the indicator sources and the breakdown sources. We're going to use indicator sources and breakdown sources to build our indicators and thus our breakdowns. So if you have a brand new instance, turn the data collectors on just before go live. Let them start collecting the data. If you don't have a brand new instance and you just got PA, it's no problem. So you'll notice that there's two type of data collectors, typically two type. So daily, which runs daily. So we're going to capture all of the new incidents uh, that were created, all of the resolved incidents, things like that. And then there's the historic one. So historics are available to run on demand. So why on demand? Because if we've learned anything from college and high school, history doesn't change. So once we run the historic one once, then we've already got all that data. It never changes and we don't need to run it again. Now, unless you've had your instance and again, you just got PA, no problem. Then you could run that historic one and capture all that data that's in the, in the history. Um, and even after you've set all these up, I know I'm guilty of this. I set them up, they all work perfectly fine. Uh, the jobs look great. But over time, you need to review the logs to make sure that there's no errors. Um, maybe you've added an extra breakdown and it's you're now bumping into the limits that PA can handle. So you need to review the logs, make sure there's no error, everything's working good. So here is a simple screenshot. This is the historic data collector. You can see in the middle of the screen, it says operator is relative and then relative start is 60 and then days ago. So this, if we ran it, would go back 60 days to, until the um, one day ago and collect all the history. So if it was a daily one, we would say daily and it would go one relative start and one relative n. And every day it would collect all the data and populate it again into the two tables that we're going to use for indicator sources and uh, breakdowns. So indicator sources. So as I just mentioned, these are populated from the data collector. Um, Make them very simple, use clear naming. I'm guilty of this myself. I created data sources that were just named like, what was what am I collecting here? I totally forgot. So I've listed a few that come out of the box like incidents closed. It's pretty clear what that's going to capture. Every day that's gonna run and it's going to capture all of the incidents that were closed. Incidents new, incidents open, incidents resolved. Very clear. All incidents? No, 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 no. Don't do things like that. Or incidents for service deaths. We don't need data, we don't need indicator sources and we don't need them specifically for a department. Um, that's what breakdowns are for when we get to breakdowns. So, Use the baseline sources if possible and minimize filtering. 
We'll talk about filtering because filtering can be done in the indicator itself, but minimize filtering conditions. So here's an example of an indicator source. You can see it's very basic. It has a name. Again, use a clear, simple name. It has a frequency. This one is daily. We have daily, uh, weekly, biweekly, monthly, yearly, fiscal year. So we have all kinds of different uh, frequencies you can use. Most common is daily, right? And then we have a facts table, incidents, and then opened on today. Simple. So this is going to capture all of the incidents that were open today. When the data collectors run, this will populate this indicator source table with all of the incidents opened today. So indicators, indicators are tied to a single indicator source, not multiple. So an indicator is tied to a single source and they can be generated directly from an indicator source. That's an automated indicator. You can apply extra filtering at this stage if you needed to. So what do I mean by that? So you've captured all the incidents that are new. Uh, in a past life, I worked for a company that was comprised of multiple companies. Even though we collected all this data on every company, we only cared about one particular company. So at this point, I can add a filter that says company is X and whatever my company is. And that will filter that data for this indicator. What you want to try and avoid is doing extra filtering such as uh, group is service desk or group is service desk and network and server. I mean, all that filtering can be handled by your breakdown, which we'll talk about. And then on your indicators, you apply the breakdowns. So your most common indicators are automated, uh, manual, formula, and indicator groups. Formulas are great. So formulas, like what if I wanted to get the average? How many, how many incidents did we close today versus how many were open? So I could build a formula, incidents uh, resolved, divided by, with a little slash, incidents opened. And that will give me my decimal of what that number is. I can then wrap it in parentheses and multiply it times 100 to get my percentage. So again, I can see very quickly, are we losing ground or are we gaining ground? And then indicator groups are just a group of a number of indicators. So here's an example of an indicator. You can see it's got a direction, minimize. So if the number goes up, is it better? Or if the number goes down, is it better? There's a checkbox for key. Um, you could mark this as a key indicator. There's no logic behind it, just that you can quickly identify your key indicators. It's got a unit. This one happens to be a number and it's got a precision. Zero, could be two. If we were talking about decimals, maybe we wanna go out two decimal points. So it could be two. It's tied to my indic indicator source, which is incidents.new. And I have collect records checked and my aggregate says count. And I value when nil. So what if we didn't get any records? Well, then we're gonna set it to zero. Now, I don't show you, but uh, I'll point my arrow at the additional conditions. So the additional conditions would be where I could say company is X, right? Just to limit the results that I'm getting back from my data collector, from my indicator source, and thus my data collectors. At the bottom, I have, this one has three breakdowns, priority, category, and assignment group. We haven't talked about breakdowns yet, but they are associated to this indicator. And then I have two jobs. There's a related list with a two. So I have two jobs associated to this. And again, one is a daily and one is a historic. So very simple, very clean. There's not a lot of fields that you need to worry about just to get started with PA. So breakdown sources, much like indicator sources, 
breakdown sources are populated from the data collector. The breakdown sources um, are basically collecting a set of records. Like for example, incident state. So we wanna capture all of the incident states. Maybe we have to do some extra filtering such as incident states that are active um, and in English, if we had multiple languages. So our breakdown sources will generate our breakdowns. Um, so breakdown sources uh, specify when specify which unique values to use. So again, filtering um, which incident states. So a couple of examples I listed, again, incident priority, right? Maybe just the active priorities. Uh, if you happen to turn off a you know, P5, right? Incident state or incident age days. So that's, uh, that comes around when we talk about bucket groups. So here is a breakdown source. So you can see it's got a name, incident state. That's a choice field. We're capturing the sys ID. The table is incident. The element is state. The language is English. You may not have that uh, line if you don't have multiple languages. And inactive is false or inactive is empty. So here we're going to capture all of our incident states for our breakdown source. Not a breakdown yet, but just in our breakdown source. So very clean, very simple. Same thing would be for priority. Uh, if it was a group, then the facts table would be the group, this group table. So breakdowns. So breakdowns are a way to slice your indicator data, right? Like I wanna filter it by priorities. I wanna see, I, today we opened up 50 tickets. I wanna view how many were priority ones, how many were priority twos. You just apply that breakdown, you click on the breakdown and it shows you the data instantly on your indicator. So breakdown types, most common, automated, manual, breakdown relations, which are child, member of, parent, and then bucket groups. So bucket groups, you define the bucket groups. Like I wanna see tickets, uh, incident tickets that are open between one and two days and three and five days and five and 10 days and then greater than 11 days. So you define the buckets that your tickets will show up in and the system will automatically put them there when you apply that bucket group. Don't apply unlimited breakdowns. So keep your breakdown list short and don't apply unlimited breakdowns. So here I've listed a couple of examples, incident priority, incident state, incident age groups. Very simple, you apply those to your indicators. So here's an example of an automated breakdown. So incident, our breakdown source, we talked about breakdown sources, is incident state. The key to this is at the bottom, it says breakdown mappings. So now the facts table is incident and our field is state. So when we apply this breakdown to our incident records, it knows what to look for, incident and state, according to the breakdown mapping. So here is our indicator. So this one is number of new incidents, 38. So it says 38 new incidents uh, for May compared to 58 that we had last month. And you see in the left, I've applied, there is two breakdowns showing priority and categorization. And I've clicked on category and now my breakdown is filtering it's showing me the records, the 38 records by category instantly on the screen. So maybe I have an issue, you know, I'm a manager and I look and I'm like, oh, why, why are server calls spiking today? Or maybe I click on the priority and, you know, filter it by priority. Why are we getting so many P1 calls, right? Uh, you know, there must be critical services down. So 
quickly a manager can look at this and figure out what's going on in the business and react to it. Here's uh, another view of an indicator. This one's called the workbench. And again, this is all test data. So here's one that says in May, May 16th, we had 72 new records. You can see uh, quickly across the top, there's 39 in progress and four on hold. And again, as a manager, I can quickly see the average open age, right? The average reassignment times. Are we getting the tickets to the right group to resolve quickly? the average last updated time, and the percentage of the tickets not updated in the last five days. So you can quickly see what's going on with your business. Um, and this is just one dashboard. You can jump to other dashboards to see other tasks that are going on. So here's, uh, here's where we are in our architecture. So we've talked about data collectors. We've talked about our tables, indicator sources, breakdown sources. We've talked about indicators and applying the breakdowns. So now that we have all this data defined, what do we do with it? So before we continue, uh, I'll ask Lisa if there's any questions that built up. I haven't seen one yet come through on this chat, but I will double check. Um... We do have a couple uh, from the community. Uh, but okay. said it's Moses, and it says 2 a.m. here in Australia. So hopefully, we'll <laughs> be able to come back and watch. So, yeah. <laughs> okay. All right. Then we'll continue on here. So. So now we've got our data built. So now we need to do something with it, right? So first, we need a dashboard. We, uh, What's a dashboard? Michael, you said um, minimizing filter conditions on indicator sources. Oh, when yes. When you would want to add those conditions. Yep. So, so minimize the filter conditions on the indicator. Is that the question? Yes. Minimize yep. the filter conditions. Mm -hmm. So don't get confused by applying filter conditions to indicators compared to breakdowns. So you can filter out records. Again, um, the data collectors will collect all of the, for example, all the incident new records, right? But what if you only want to report on one company? Don't instead just say uh, group is service desk. Um, you know, if you want to filter by one company, no problem, but don't try and apply breakdowns as filters, use breakdowns. Hope I explained that correctly. You said, uh, but what about don't apply unlimited breakdowns? Yeah, so unlimited breakdowns. So try and minimize the breakdowns you apply to an indicator. So uh, PA has limits on the records that it will return in the data collectors. Uh, I think initially 50,000, but for every breakdown that you add, it goes up exponentially. So what happens is, Maybe you are, you know, oh, I'm only querying 10,000 incident records, for example, but I have 20 breakdowns associated. It goes up exponentially. And before you know it, you're bumping into the limits of PA and you get the errors. So if you're not reviewing the logs, you won't see the errors. So always try to minimize your breakdowns if possible. Otherwise, again, I think by the time you apply all the uh, breakdowns, the limit is a million records it can return. And it changes all the time. Okay, great. All right. All right, so, so dashboards. So dashboards, very similar to home pages, except much cooler. Uh, so dashboards are a collection of your widgets. Dashboards contain both indicators and breakdowns and filters. Um, dashboards can have multiple tabs, which make them so much cooler than home pages. Home pages don't have multiple tabs, right? But the dashboard does. So from this view, I just filtered, show me all the incident dashboards. And you can see this is baseline data. So you can see that it comes out of the box with seven different dashboards. And I would bet each one of those has multiple tabs to show you 
what's going on in your business. Now, from this view in the upper left-hand corner, there's a new button. I could create a new dashboard right from here. If I'm in a dashboard, for example, <laughs> then I could just click on the little hamburger and say new dashboard. If I wanted to, I could delete that dashboard. Maybe I made a mistake or I could duplicate a dashboard to use in the future. So it's very easy to create a dashboard either from the new button, from the main dashboard screen or from inside uh, a dashboard. So now you've got your dashboard. Now we need to apply our widgets. Our widgets are nothing more than a reusable view of an indicator. You know, very simple. Widget types, time series, right? Obviously it's a vision over time. Uh, single score, uh, a list widget type, a breakdown, a workbench, which I've already showed you what a workbench looks like, or a pivot. So to add a widget to a dashboard, there's a little plus sign. You click the plus sign. You get a menu that looks very similar to if you're adding content to a home page. You choose performance analytics. And then you're presented with, what do you want to add? A breakdown, a list, a pivot, a score, et cetera. And you click on, what kind of indicator did I build? So if you clicked on score, for example, you're presented with your score indicators and you choose the indicator that you want to add to the dashboard. Uh, and again, you position it just like you do on the home page, nothing different. And that's how you build your dashboard and present your information. Very simple, it, you know, and that's really what this talk was about is to get you going into PA. It's not detailed in talk. It's just to keep things very simple and keep it very organized. So now we've talked about everything. Our data collectors, our source tables, our indicators, our breakdowns. We've got all that data. Now we built our widgets. We put our widgets on our dashboards. Simple. And I hope you agree it's simple. So lessons learned, identify the metrics that matter for your business, right? Your business objectives. I mean, and again, push back when they say, we wanna see everything, right? It needs to be specific business objectives. Uh, try to use the baseline indicator sources. Um, you know, you'll notice that as I, as I showed you, Indicator sources like incident new, incident open, incident result, they all come baseline. So unless you have a custom table, you don't need to really create any indicator sources. Um, your indicators, dashboards, breakdown don't need to be perfect, especially in the beginning, right? Just get the data going. The data collector will always collect the data, but maybe you applied the wrong breakdown. Maybe you sliced it the wrong way. It's no problem. The data still exists. You just need to readjust your breakdown or readjust your indicator. It doesn't have to be perfect day one. And then keep it simple. I mean, I'm, I'm guilty myself of not keeping it simple. So, I mean, that's a, definitely a lesson learned for me. And then content packs. So if you have the full PA, you can install, uh, there's lots of plugins with content content packs and all of the necessary pieces, the indicator sources, uh, the indicators all come in that content pack. So initially there may not be anything for you to build. It may all come uh, in the plugin. And so with that. We do have a question. So JS have posted, do you have examples for using PA with the main separation? <laughs> I don't have any examples of using PA with domain separation, um, but I, I think it's brand new in Orlando, if I'm not mistaken. I think it supports it now, but I don't have any examples of that. When I worked in domain separation, um, PA wasn't even around, unfortunately. Okay. Do we have any other questions coming up? Mm -hmm. And okay, 
He says, I know it breaks out in the simple objective of this talk. You know it breaks out of the simple. I didn't hear you. I didn't, I don't I don't know what you're can you say it again? Um yeah, it's a JS wrote um in a reply. I know it breaks out of the simple objective of this talk. <laughs> yes. Yeah. I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm sorry that you're on domain separation, but I mean again, you know, you can get really good at it over over time. I mean, I I think I just spent way too long in it. <laughs> <laughs> Well, okay. Well, you know, our 30 minutes is up and a little over, but this has been great. If Perfect. anyone has additional further questions, um, please do reference that, that this link um, that is available in the chat. Um, the recording loop is already there as soon as even when we stop it. And you can post more questions and Michael will be following it to be able to answer questions in the future. So again, we thank you all for joining us and you have a fantastic day and knowledge. Thank you, Michael. Thank you. Take care, everybody.